Hey, I know some of you right now are thinking to yourselves, we're supposed to be singing. We always sing after the children's time, and, and you're out there, and this is not right. And, and I just want you to know that we change up the schedule every so often just to help those of you who are trapped in your OCD. Because, uh, you know, Jesus came to set us free, and so we're going we're gonna to mess up your schedule just because we can. Uh, hey, uh, something before, uh, by the way, I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're continuing our series, A uh, Letter to Friends, looking at the book of Philippians. And if you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that's okay. Grab one in the pews around you. It looks just like this. Turn to page 1,248, and you will find Philippians chapter 2 there. And by the way, if you need a Bible, uh, you don't have the Word of God, you want to read it, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, be able to use the Word of God, because we know it'll change your life uh, if you do. Hey, while, uh, while you're finding Philippians 2, let me just mention that in uh, two weeks from today, we are having a baptism party down at the lake. We're going to do uh, lake baptisms on June 7th, and if you are in that place in your life where you know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but you've never declared that publicly, you, you've never taken that step and said, hey, to the world, I'm an unashamed follower of Jesus Christ, and you would like to do that, then please let us know. We would love to help you be obedient to Christ. And so for uh, the baptism that day, all you got to do is call the church office and say, put me on the list. We're already building a list. We've got people who are saying, I want to do that and I want to be a part of that. So if that applies to you, let us know. We would love, as I said, to help you uh, in your journey following Jesus to tell the world that you're his and that he's changed your life. Hey, today we are talking about our journey to joy. Journey to joy. And in the last three weeks, I have made two joyful journeys myself. In fact, I helped both my girls move back to Lake Havasu City. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. And, and so uh, I'm excited. My youngest, Alyssa, is going to be teaching uh, at Nautilus Elementary School. And my oldest daughter, Amber, is going to be uh, a new mom to our first grandchild. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's kind of cool, too. By the way, and just, and just the other side of it, the reason that she moved back here is because her husband, Robert Smith, is going to be our new youth pastor here at Calvary. Um, yeah, and for those of you who right away are going, but what about Pastor O.C.? For the record and for clarity and to kill gossip and rumors, Pastor O.C. is not going anywhere, okay? Yeah. He, by the way, we promoted him a year and a half ago to family pastor, and we're finally getting around to getting him some help. So uh, <laughs> that's what it boils down to. But he's not leaving. We, we heard that last night. I shared this, and people go, well, when's Pastor O.C. leaving? Because I want to say goodbye. He's not going anywhere. It's in his contract. Anyway, uh, so I'm celebrating. <laughs> Look, I'm happy. I'm celebrating. It, this is great news. I had these joyful journeys. And uh, so I'm celebrating, and I'm sore. Because I help them move. I hate moving. Is anybody with me on that? You hate me? Yes, it's terrible. I, I mean, it's just, it's not, okay, I'm 52 years old. And the only things that I really want to lift and move are the remote control and a bowl of ice cream, okay? That, that just, uh, okay, golf clubs, that doesn't count. That's not work. So um, anyway, and, and I drove 1,700 miles one way, uh, you know, across this country in two and a half days. And I, you know, uh, but it was a journey to joy. I'm sore, I'm uh, painful, but it was worth the, the effort for, because it was such a joyful journey. So today I want to talk about our journeys to joy. I, I want to talk about the fact that we can get where we want to be, but it's going to hurt a little, uh, maybe a lot if we're going to make that journey to joy. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul is writing to his friends, his dear friends whom he loves with all his heart at the church in Philippi. Here's what he says, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Paul wants his joy to be complete. Complete my joy. 
And, and I'm assuming that uh, you want complete joy as well. Do you guys want complete joy? Okay, good. I, we're on the right track together then. In fact, I've never met anyone in all my days that ever came to me and said, Pastor Chad, I've got too much joy in my life. I am overjoyed and it's killing me. Could you help me? I need some more pain. I need some tragedy. I, I need something you know, really difficult. You know, I need a friend to betray me or something because I'm just too joyful. No, that never happens. We all want more joy. We want this journey and Paul wanted it too. He says, complete my joy. So, uh, I want to talk today about how we can make progress in our journey for joy. Uh, get where we want to be. And, and Paul shares some really powerful things in this passage, these few verses. First of all, let's talk about joy in the church. Joy in the church. Our joy together. Uh, here's an observation. You're not going to experience great personal joy as a follower of Christ unless you experience joy in the family of faith. If you're connected to a, a, a church that is fighting, that, that is angry, that is divided, you're not going to have great personal joy. You're not going to make that joy complete. And Paul knew that because he's writing to the church in Philippi. He's writing to his friends and he says, listen, if you have any encouragement in Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if you have any participation with his spirit, if there's any affection or sympathy for people, by the way, does any of this apply to you? When you're reading that, you kind of go, yeah, that's me. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then you're included in this. Paul is talking to us. He's talking to you and to me. He's saying, hey, you guys get it. You've experienced this. You've got encouragement from Christ. You, you felt his love. You, you've participated in the Holy Spirit because he's in you. So Paul says, make my joy complete by being unified in Christ. Unified in Christ. Notice he says, have the same mind, have the same love, be of one mind. He keeps using those words that talk about unity. So know this, our joy is dependent upon our unity. Our unity is key to our joy. But when Paul's talking about this, he's talking about unity, not uniformity. There's a big difference. Unity, not uniformity. And a lot of churches kind of go off the rails at this point because they, inter they, they, they read unity and they interpret uniformity. And so they want everybody to kind of look the same, dress the same, you know, wear their hair the same. Uh, we're going to read the same books. We're going to go to the same movies. We're going to vote the same party. We're going to do all this kind of stuff because we want to be the same. That way we won't have any disunity. And that's uniformity. That's not unity. And God's not for uniformity. God does not want a whole bunch of Stepford Christians. All right? You guys old enough to get that reference? Let's see your hands. Okay, good. Hey, you know, and, and if you're not, then there's always Netflix, right? So, um, you know, God's not in favor of cookie-cutter automatons that, you know, perfect the art of being boring and weird. If you haven't noticed, God loves diversity. Have you, have you gone outside and looked around? You know, there's more than one flower, right? Because God loves diversity. There, there's more than one, you know, climate or, you know, geographical kind of area, ecological zone. I just drove back from Kentucky and I started off in green and humidity. And I came across and went through some like, you know, small mountains and green. And we got to the plains and then we got to Texas. Yeah, it's ugly. And then we got to like the mountains, you know, real mountains, not the little ones back east. And then we got to the glorious desert. And uh, which is where we all belong. And so, you know, all these, and this is just 1,700 miles in America. See, the, God loves diversity. There's more than just one color. There's more than just one flavor ice cream. <laughs> Praise God. So, uh, see, God wants our unity. He doesn't want our uniformity. And the only thing we're supposed to conform to is the image of Christ. So how do we understand these admonitions? These challenges to unity that, that Paul wants us to have that'll lead to joy. Well, let me just unpack this a little real briefly. First of all, same mind is essential beliefs. Essential beliefs. You know, churches fight over doctrine. That's why there's so many different kinds of churches, so many different denominations. We fight over belief systems and things. We, we fight over, you know, soteriology and ecclesiology and eschatology and pneumatology. 
<laughs> I did that just so I could prove I went to seminary. <laughs> See, isn't that really cool? All right, let me just rephrase that. Okay, Christians fight over, you know, how we get saved and, and how we should do church and what's going to happen in the end times and, and what's the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church with gifts. See, we fight about those things, and, and yet we can't really experience joy when we're fighting. So at Calvary, here's what we do. We boil our essential beliefs down to five statements that we pretty much believe that every gospel-preaching church is going to agree with, and, and we think that you'll agree too. First one, the Bible is the Word of God, the inerrant, inspired Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live, because everything's based on what the Bible tells us. Secondly, there is one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Third, Jesus is the Son of God. He came in the flesh. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Fourth, we're all sinners. All people are sinners and need the grace of God. Fifth, salvation is only through faith in Jesus alone. That's it. And so we boil it down and say, we're not going to fight about the rest of stuff. We're going to study the Bible and all those other doctrines are important. And we want you to study God's word. We want you to have opinions. We want to discuss them. We want to challenge one another, but we're not going to divide over them. We want to focus on our commonalities, the things that we share together, not our differences. For hundreds of years, churches have emphasized their differences and who is right. And the truth is, when you compare us to the world, we got more in common with people of faith uh, that call themselves Christians than we have differences. And so we want to uh, celebrate those and accentuate those. So the same mind is essential beliefs. And then we're supposed to have the same love. So we're going to agree on the ethic of love. The ethic of love. You know this. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets, the entire Old Testament, hangs on those two statements. It's all built around those two statements. So Jesus wanted us to hone an ethic of love. And, and so at Calvary, what we've done with that is we simply go, hey, the maturity, how we evaluate someone's progression in their spiritual life, it is not measured by how much you know about God, but how well you love in God's name. See, a lot of churches will emphasize how much you know. How, how many of you guys were, uh, you know, kids in church doing the Bible drills, trying to find the, you know, Ezekiel or something? Anybody else do that with me? Okay, a few of you did. And, and because you were the fastest finding the books in the Bible, that made you the best Christian, right? Because you, got the, the, you know, got the stickers, you got the little certificates, I won the Bible drill, I'm more spiritual than you. <laughs> Except it doesn't work that way. And yet we grow kids up in the church and they think, well, I know, well, I know what the minor prophets are. and you don't. I know those words that Pastor Chad used and you didn't. And so I, apparently I'm more spiritual than you. And we elevate those people to leaders and the thing is they know a lot, but they don't love a lot. Now the two aren't mutually exclusive, but when we value knowledge over love, then we build weak churches that are torn apart by strife and not by unity. Do you remember the old, you know, kind of Jesus movement song from the 60s and 70s? They'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we're Christians by our love. Maybe that's why so many people look at church and don't see Christ there. The Apostle Paul said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So we want to have an ethic of love because joy is experienced when we own that ethic of love. And, and so tragically, there's lots of Christians who seem willing to sacrifice unity because they want to grind their you know, issues acts on the unity of the church and elevate their doctrine, their convictions, their practices uh, you know, above everyone else's. And they have to be right. And if you have to be right, let me just tell you right now, go ahead and repent. Because Jesus is right and we're all wrong. We're all wrong. We're sinners. So um, if we're going to have joy in the, in the church, if we're going to have joy together, we've got to share some, the same mind, essential beliefs, same love, ethic of love, and we've got to be united in purpose, one mind in full accord. Now, we don't agree on lots of stuff, right? We already know that. 
Like, you know, where's the best place to order pizza or the best flavor ice cream? We're not going to agree on that. What's the best car to drive or the best music to play on the radio? We're not going to agree on that. How about this one? What's the best time of day? Yeah, how many of you are morning people? Let's see your hands. How many of you are night people? Yeah, more at 11 o'clock service. I'm just telling you, 8 o'clock, it was the other way around, man. There was a lot more morning people there. And, I, and I, so, and wait, how many of you are married, uh, morning people married to night people? <laughs> or night people married to morning people? Yeah, see, God has a sense of humor. You can't settle that, and we don't need to. We don't need to agree on all that stuff, but what will give the church joy is when we are united in our purpose. When we share a focus that lets us join together on the mission of Christ and make an eternal difference that feeds joy into our lives. So here at Calvary, we put it this way. The purpose of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. In other words, all the decisions that we make, all the stuff that we do is focused on these things, to lead people to Jesus because he's the only one who can change their life. We can't do it. Church can't do it, but Jesus can do it. So we lead them to Jesus and we do that by loving people, that ethic of love, and by telling them the truth when we have an opportunity, when they invite us to speak into their lives. Then we share with them that Jesus is the only way they can have that life-changing encounter. So, so that's what we're doing, and we, we hope and pray that you are growing in joy as you worship and connect and learn and serve with us here at Calvary. And, and we're, we're celebrating Jesus while we're focused on his mission, and we want you to join us in that. So that's joy in the church. That's our joy. Paul says, make my joy complete by being same mind, same love, united in spirit and purpose. Now let's talk about joy in your life. Um, Paul, I think, moves from addressing the us factor, the us getting along, to much more of a a personal ethic that's going to lead to joy. Um, And and see, each of our personal journeys affect the whole because we're part of this body of Christ. And so what we do together as a group affects you as an individual, and what you do as an individual affects us as a group because we're connected. But let's get a little bit personal here. Verses 3 and 4, Paul says... Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Uh, I kind of remember encountering these verses for the first time when I was 16 years old, uh, participating in a youth camp. And uh, honestly, I didn't really like who I was. And so I asked God to change me. Do whatever it takes to change my life. And God started using these two little verses to begin redirecting my life. And by the way, I'm still trying to figure out how to apply them to my life. Still remind myself every day that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know that if God can do that in my life, God can change your life as well. So here's what Paul is telling us. If we want to increase our joy and continue that journey toward complete joy. First of all, we need to repent of selfishness. Repent of selfishness. Did you catch that in verse 3? Do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Wow, that is so hard because we are naturally selfish people, aren't we? Well, some of you are. I am. I know that. Because, you know, that's what sin does to us. It taints us. It twists our soul so that we want for us. We think about us. How is this going to impact me? How is your actions going to affect me? You make me feel sick. You make me feel wonderful. You make me feel angry. See, it's all about me. That's what selfishness does. It's all about me. And we don't want to let go of that because that's how we see the world. That's our natural man's way of seeing the world. And it's really, really obvious in my life, I'm just going to confess this, when I get behind the wheel of a car. I just tell you, I try not to be selfish, but when I'm driving, I'm selfish, okay? I don't do road rage stuff. I don't flip people off and yell at them or run them off the road, okay? I'm, I, I want you to know that about me. But when, but when I'm driving a car, I am talking to you, okay? I'm talking to you, and, and I'm not really nice, uh, because I'm selfish, and so I want you to speed up, or I want you to move over. I don't, you know, I want you to get out of my way. I don't want you to pull over, and you know, I, I want the traffic lights to all be green for me, because I've discovered that I am an incredibly selfish driver. 
And, uh, and so God's dealing with me about that. But that's when my selfishness is so clear to me. Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, starts with this statement. It's not about you. It's not about you. Of course, he's just echoing Jesus who said, if you're going to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and come follow me. In other words, following Jesus begins when we deny ourselves, when we challenge the selfish mindset that we have in our lives. So do you really want joy in your life? Okay, well, I just was wondering. I mean, I thought maybe you guys were the first exceptions I'd ever met. So, so do you really want joy in your life? Yeah. Then you have to repent of selfishness. And, and let me just say this. If you're not able to look at your life and see the selfishness that's there, ask your spouse. <laughs> I think they may be able to help you, okay? With gentleness, right? Because we don't want to start more problems. So, uh, and if you're not able to ask your spouse because, you know, they, you, you, the relationship's too rocky right now, then ask some friends that you don't value. Uh, or... Um, <laughs> Because you might lose them if you listen to them. Or your kids, they'll tell you, they can see it. You know, in other words, take that risk and look in the mirror and let God show you where you're being selfish. Because if you want joy, you got to repent of selfishness and you got to value others. He goes on, count others more significant than yourselves. Now, Paul's not saying that people are more important than you. But he's not saying that they're less important than you either. In fact, every one of us is of equal value to God because he loves us. He created us. He sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for us so that we could become sons and daughters of God. That's his plan. That's his desire. So when he looks at people, he values people. But Paul says, look, if you want joy, then you have to consider others to be as important as you are. Their needs, their agendas, their things, that their life, their time is just as important as your time, as your life, as your needs. And the place that that begins is at home. Look at your spouse, look at your kids, and figure out how you can serve them, how you can help them, how you can bless them. I'm not suggesting that you indulge them or appease them or spoil them, but bless them like Jesus blessed us, like Jesus blessed the disciples. Because Jesus didn't do what the disciples wanted him to do, right? Jesus said, hey, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to get crucified. And and Peter stands up and goes, no, you're not, Jesus. I'm not going to let you do that. What did Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Get out of the way, dude. I'm going there anyway. And Jesus didn't give the disciples what they wanted either, right? Because the disciples, what did they ask Jesus for? Hey, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, we want to be number one and number two. We want to be thing one and thing two. We want to be the top dogs, Right? Can you do that for us? And Jesus said, that's not for me to give. Uh Uh-uh. That's for the Father to give. Don't worry about that. But here's the thing. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to be the servant of everyone. Servant of everyone. He said, look, value others. Look at their needs. See them and serve them. I mean, Jesus served us, and he was God in the flesh. We need to serve others. Let me ask you, uh, this is a hard question. I hope you, I hope you wrestle with this. But when you see people, because you're going to leave this place, you're going to see people all over the place, on the road, you're going to see them at restaurants and doctor's offices, grocery stores. When you see people, can you see them as someone who's loved by God, just like God loves you? Can you see them as people that God has placed in your life and in your path for you to serve them So you go to a a restaurant, right? And the waiter or the waitress you think is there to serve you, right? And they are. That's their job, and they're going to take care of you. But but do you ever think about the fact that, that God gave you that waiter or waitress for you to serve them, for you to bless them, for you to encourage them? You go to the doctor's office. You don't feel good. You're there for them to take care of you. But have you ever stopped and thought that, hey, each one of these people is important to God and God has placed them in my path for me to be able to bless them, to serve them? 
You see, that's a whole different way of looking at life because we're usually looking at life for how are these people going to help me? And you invert that and you start thinking, how can I help them? Valuing others. If you want to have more joy, then you got to start looking at other people differently and value them as much as you value your own life. And then you got to help people succeed. Did you catch verse four? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, to his own success, but also to the interests of others, to their success. See, a great servant helps his master be successful. And Jesus has asked us to be great servants, not just to him, but to everyone. So if we're serving others, we will help them succeed. We'll help them fulfill their dreams. We'll help them accomplish their goals. We'll help them grow as a person. We'll help them become the person God created them to be. And if you're busy helping them be a success, you will have more joy in your life, which is what you want in the first place. Now, here's an easy test, kind of for your heart. You and God can have this conversation. But when you hear about someone else's success, someone in your life group, somebody in your family or coworker or something like that, when you hear about somebody else's success, do you rejoice or do you get jealous? See, if you get jealous, then that's a heart issue that says you're not trying to help people succeed. You're not valuing them. And, and you're really living in that selfish paradigm. If you're saying, God, how come you didn't bless me like that? That's jealousy and not rejoicing. So if you want more joy, repent of selfishness, value others, and help people succeed. Now, I want to close by sharing with you the, the serve principle. Because I know this whole concept of serving uh, leading to joy, it's a painful concept for us to embrace because it involves self-denial. We have to deny, deny ourselves and take up a cross and follow Jesus. We have to see the world differently. And this is some heavy lifting from, you know, third floor apartments kind of thing. This is painful stuff. It's difficult stuff. Because I'm asking you to embrace an idea, identity of a servant, not just do acts of service. Jesus wants us to embrace the identity of a servant, not just do acts of service. Uh, There's a cool thing in our culture that's going on right now, and you guys uh, know about that. It's kind of random act of kindness things, paying it forward, right? You ever bought somebody coffee at Starbucks and they didn't tell them about it? It feels good, doesn't it? But a lot of times what we do is we kind of go, hey, I paid it forward, check the box, I'm done, I can go home and be selfish now. (laughs) Right? Right? Or we say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to Peach Springs and I'm going to serve that, that, you know, community and I'm going to bless those kids. And then I can check my box. I did my good deed for the month. I went on a mission project for a day. And see, here's the thing. God does not call us to random acts of kindness. He calls us to live our lives as servants. Which means that we get up in the morning and we look at life and we go, how do I serve the people that God sends my way? How can I bless them? How can I help them succeed? How can I value them every single day? Because that's our calling as children of God. See, we have specific callings. Like some of us are called to be preachers and some are called to be counselors. Some are called to be doctors and teachers and auto mechanics. I praise God for auto mechanics because I can't do that stuff. But, But here's the thing, all of us, who are followers of Christ, are called to be servants. We're called to be servants. And and so listen to this and see if the serve principle makes sense. Um, What is the selfish number? Oh, one. Okay, everybody gets that. Selfish number is one. If you live a selfish life, who's for you? You are, yeah? Who's watching out for you? You are, yeah. Who's committing? Who's committed to protecting and promoting you? You, yeah, that's it. You are all by your little onesie, just you. So you know, it's like, you're like, hey, it's all I'm, I got to be for me, and that's what selfish is. Selfish is all about me. So you you can't trust anybody else because they might betray you, they might you know hurt you, they might you know undermine you. So you got to look out for number one. One is a selfish number. What's the serve number? What's the serve number? Yeah, see, the serve number is God plus multitudes. God plus multitudes. See, here's how it works. If you're serving others, if you're living your life as a servant, other people will start serving you. 
You go, well, I, you know, how do I know that's going to happen? Because God says it's going to happen. Because it's the way he built the world to work. Because, you know, Scripture tells us there's this principle that you will reap what you sow. Yeah, you will reap what you sow. So if you serve others, other people start serving you. By the way, that's kind of the way God designed the church to function. He wants us to come together as a group of people who are not looking out for ourselves, but we're looking out for each other's interests. And instead of you taking care of you, one person looking after you, you're looking after other people, other people are looking after other people, we're all looking after each other. And you've got multitudes of people who are around you who are looking out for your interests. That's the way God designed the church, his body to work. And you see it perfectly when you're part of a life group or a small group of people who love each other and care for each other and pray for each other and share life together and take care of one another when they're sick. It is a beautiful thing. That's why we want everyone connected to life groups so that you can experience the family of God because that's where this service thing becomes reality in your life. You serve others, others will serve you. And, and here's the better part, when you serve, when you are a servant God is for you. You go, I thought God was for me all the time if I belonged to him. Yes, he's for you all the time. But if you're committed to living life selfishly, I think God kind of like gets a you know, box of popcorn and says, all right, I'm gonna sit down and watch this movie and see how it turns out. <laughs> Let's see what this guy's gonna do because he thinks he's got it all together. <laughs> Scripture says this, Old Testament and New Testament. Peter and James both say this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, let, me, let me tweak the words a little bit because I think they're consistent. God opposes the selfish, but gives grace to the servants. I think that applies. I think that applies. And so when we embrace this identity of being a servant, who's for you? God is and a bunch of other people. And who's watching out for you? God and a bunch of other people. Who's, who's committed to promoting and protecting you? God and, and the people around you. Now, that sounds like an equation that's gonna work in life and gonna visit joy in your life because now you don't have to be watching out for you. Other people got your back and God is the one who is promoting you and protecting you because you've bought into his principle to serve like Jesus. And I know this is hard because, again, we have to look at our lives and we have to change our directions. We have to say, okay, I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to stop being selfish. I'm going to repent of that. But I like those odds way better than just taking care of me. So what makes more sense to you, a selfish life or a servant life? I don't think the answer is that hard. Servant life makes a lot more sense to me, but it's easy to say those words. It's difficult to live those words. So you're on a journey. Is it leading you to joy, to complete joy? If it's not, then why don't you redirect your life today? The Apostle Paul told us how Jesus is rooting for you. It'll change everything if you do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for serving us. Because when we were still sinners living in our rebellion, you sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die for us. And, and we rejoice in that. So God, make us one. Unify our hearts and our minds around your purpose, around your life. Teach us how to be servants. God, teach us how to repent of our selfishness, to bless our families and our friends and this community and this church and everyone that we come in contact with. Open our eyes and fill us with your Holy Spirit like never before so that we might live as sons and daughters of the living God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.